Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Baron Reed, Professor of Philosophy and Deputy Director of the Northwestern Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. Our mission is to foster meaningful engagement across borders of all kinds. On today, uh, International Education Day, it's an honor to have here with us Brian Brayboy and Noah Sobe. Brian Brayboy, the Lumbee Tribe, is in his first year at Northwestern as the new Dean of the School of Education and Social Policy and the Carlos Montezuma Professor of Education and Social Policy. Having come to us from Arizona State University, where he served as a Vice President of Social Advancement and as a professor in the School of Social Transformation. Dean Brayboy is the author of more than 100 books, journal, journal articles, and policy briefs that explore the ways that institutions both help and hinder underserved students, faculty, and staff. He's perhaps best known for his development of tribal, tribal critical race theory, a framework for understanding the complexity of indigenous people's interactions with education, colonization, and racism. Noah Sobe is a professor of modern European history at Loyola University Chicago, with his attention given both to the history of education and to its futures. He is the author or editor of several books, as well as dozens of journal articles and book chapters on educational policies and practices, especially as they circulate transnationally. From 2019 to 2022, Professor Sobe worked as a senior project officer with UNESCO on the Future of Learning and Innovation team, where he helped to lead the research and drafting of the UNESCO flagship report, Reimagining Our Futures Together, a New Social Contract for Education. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Dean Brayboy and Professor Sobe, and thanks to all in our audience here at the Northwestern Buffett Institute and online. We will reserve some time for questions after our initial discussion. For those tuning in virtually, I encourage you to submit any questions you may have uh, during the event in the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible today. Okay, Brian and Noah, you both talk about educational institutions as sites of cultural production and not merely places where culture is reproduced. That is to say, in non-academic terms, education profoundly shapes both the present and the future of the world, and for this reason, it's often at the center of culture wars. Noah, the subtitle of the UNESCO report your group authored is A New Social Contract for Education. What kind of new social contract did you have in mind? And if I may ask, why did you go with the singular here as opposed to the plural, new social contracts? Thanks very much, Baron. Uh, and it's great to be here. I really appreciate uh, the chance to talk with Brian and you all uh, about these questions. So, I mean, my answer is going to be that we clearly need lots of localized actions taken together and concerted global action. But the first thing I want to do is draw attention to the title of this event, which I think is perfectly named Global Futures of Education, Futures in the Plural. Um, I see that as a sort of uh, pragmatic recognition of reality. There will be multiple futures of education, but also that uh, that's something that's quite desirable. You know. There, there are and should continue to be, um, you know, a variety of ways that human beings on this shared planet, you know, teach and learn from one another. Um, so uh, that idea of thinking about futures in the plural uh, was something uh, deeply connected to UNESCO's futures project that you mentioned that I was involved with. Um, you know, uh, maybe it goes without saying, but for, for some time, uh, you know, we have had singular visions of a future, uh, often projected from one particular place on the planet, um, imposed on others. Um, so we clearly need to move out of that mode. Uh, it continues today. I would just point us to Silicon Valley, for example, um, imposing or attempting to impose singular future of education. Um, but I, I do agree it's really important to think uh, in terms of futures in the plural. Um, you know, the UNESCO project was uh, a, a real team project that was uh, headed by an international commission chaired by the president of Ethiopia. Overall, we had over a million people offering ideas, you know, and, and the core of the argument, and this is, I think, the, the, the key argument for why we need a no social contract for education is, you know, recognizing that the world's at a turning point, you know, if we keep doing more of the same, whether we do it faster, more efficiently, even more fairly, um, we're heading towards a cliff. 
right? So we need a radical change, of course. You know, we can continue on an unsustainable path, um, or we can make uh, significant transformations. Now, education uh, is key to any social transformation. Knowledge and learning um, uh, are uh, essential um, points of leverage in achieving change. And unfortunately, the way we've set up our education systems today, um, they don't always support um, and in fact, they're responsible for some of the problems we have in the world. So the call, and uh, uh, I mean, I very much agree with this, the call in the UNESCO report is for a new social contract for education that can both repair past injustices and transform the future. And that dual gaze to the past and the future, I think is somewhat unusual um, in, the, uh, in the education futures work. So I, you know, on, a le on one level, this needs to happen in global terms. You know, we're part of an interconnected, world-spanning community, and, you know, we need to figure out new ways to live well together by our own choosing and making. And I would say that's the core of, of a new social contract uh, idea. You know, at the same time, we need, you know, localized social contracts, people coming together um, to affect change in their communities, to make their education systems, again, support uh, us to live well together according to our you know, choosing and making. Thank you. Um, so Brian, in his answer, Noah is talking about the need to have both a backward look and a forward look um, as we consider education. That I, I think connects very nicely with some of your work on tribal critical race theory which is centered on a recognition of the harms that colonization and racism have caused for indigenous peoples. There, of course, have been a multitude of harms, um, but some of the deepest injuries have occurred in residential schools and other educational institutions. How does that history bear on our ability to form a new social contract for education? Thank you, and thanks for having me and for hosting this, and thanks to the Buffett Institute. Um, thank you, Noah. Um, I think there are a couple of things here, and I want to just sort of be really clear about the language that I use. So I will talk about both education and schooling. They are not the same thing. Schooling is a process. Sometimes it happens in, in buildings. Sometimes it happens outside of them. But there's a particular purpose and set of knowledges that, that get framed often by some outside entity. I think about education as something, sometimes people call it informal, but I, I, I don't actually think that's it. It's, it's really... Um, I think about it as, as what it means for us to prepare children for the world in which they're going to live. Um, and there are all kinds of things outside of school that, that do that. So residential schools, boarding schools um, get started in, in 18, roughly 1887 with the sole mission, although it, it's a little bit more complicated than this, of, of killing the Indian and saving the man, um, a process of deep assimilation. Uh, which becomes a really important point to this larger social contract. But there's a, for me, there's an even more insidious undercurrent to that in terms of this larger sets of, of conversations. If you remove children from their homes um, and you send them off someplace to have them learn a particular set of ways of being in the, in the world, you shift their, um, their prospect of that, but you also then um, part of the process for the U.S. government was also a, a massive land grab. And if we're going to think about futures and we're going to think about social contracts, we've got to have a really serious engagement with land, but also with place. And those things for me aren't the same thing. Land is, is a physical thing, the ground that we live on. Place is what happens when humans begin to imbue that with meaning. And so that shifts things very much. I mean, the, the lake is not not far away and sometimes people look at it and there are these arguments about who's allowed on it and who isn't and there's larger questions about the watershed etc cetera, etc cetera. but there's a whole group of people that have a particular set of relationships with the lake that's different than who owns it who manages traffic on it etc cetera, etc cetera. in the process of removing children from um, communities you begin to break up a collective um, and um, and then rights to land, which then means the federal government at the time has this um, prospect of then beginning to claim those lands, either by killing people, which was the initial response, 
to then putting them in, into schools. And so I think that becomes a really important piece of it. But I also think those schools did something really important um, to Noah's point earlier, which is when you pull children out of communities, you do a whole bunch of things. You destroy hope in those communities. For any of us who are parents or have relationships with children, it, um, missing our kids is, is um, profoundly traumatic if we think there's something happening with them. Um, you also rob those parents of, of being parents. Uh, and so you disrupt these cultural ways of thinking about, about futures and preparing children for the world in which they're going to live rather than preparing them um, in other ways. But I think most profoundly what you do is you foreclose futures. Um, you foreclose futures of individual children and of, of communities. I mean, our children are, are really our future, our children and our grandchildren. So if we're not really thoughtful about, um, about that historically and the importance of it, the residual effects of, of that, and boarding schools go away in 87, by the way. Um, they were still around. They were different than they were 1987, um, so 100 years. So um, they shift in really profound ways, but it, it is the legacy of that, the historical trauma attached to that, the fact that parenting shifts in how we raise children changes with it. And so if we're gonna think about possible futures and really productive futures, it becomes an important part of this conversation. Thank you. Uh, Noah, according to the UNESCO report, um, quoting from that report, any new social contract must build on the broad principles that underpin human rights, inclusion and equity, cooperation and solidarity, as well as collective responsibility and interconnected, interconnectedness. Now, anyone who's been following American politics uh, recently, as well as over the past uh, several decades, will know that centering educational policy on inclusion and equity has become quite contentious. How do you think this affects the prospects for forming a, con a consensus around these principles, both here and elsewhere in the world? Yeah, God help us all. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, so, okay, I would say that what's on the table, what Brian and I are talking about, is how we organize education, who's involved, how they're involved, and what kind of public project, you know, education is going to be. Um, uh, and as, Baron, as your comment got at, you know, there are many places around the world where the situation is no better than it is in this country right now. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, it's possible that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, were it up for adoption today, would not actually be adopted. Um, but it was, and we can hold on to that fact. Um, and I think we, in these times, we desperately need to. Um, so any new social contract for education needs to be built on the principles uh, that underpin human rights, you know, equal dignity um, of the human being, so our basic fundamental rights, you know, to shelter, to decent work, right, um, uh, to free expression, and to education. So uh, one piece is assuring the right to quality education throughout life. The second is strengthening education as a public endeavor and a common good. So a public endeavor, not just publicly funded, um, but, pu but one marked by public participation um, and a common good, you know, something that supports our shared well-being, um, a shared well-being that's chosen and achieved together. And I think Brian's comments got out of that. Um, I guess I just, I have some faith um, that participation, uh, particularly around education, does hold promise for bridging some of the political craziness out there. I mean, I realize education is one of the key fronts of the current culture wars that we're in, um, but I do think that even in our divisive times, it is possible to get people together. Um, and uh, I think I would actually, to get really concrete, I think there's uh, three questions that we can ask people um, that help us work together across differences to do, bring positive change to education. The first question is, what do we do in our education systems that we should continue, right? What is it that serves some people well, maybe needs to serve other people well as, uh, better as well? You know, what is it that needs to be strengthened, maybe even safeguarded? So that first question, you know, what do we want to continue in our systems? And then follow that 
uh, with a question about what is it that we we want to abandon? What do we need to move beyond? Beyond? What do we want to hospice to a to a gentle uh, removal, right, from our world, right? And then the final question is, what do we need to do differently? You know, what do we need to creatively reinvent together? And I, I think, unfortunately, too much education futures work starts with that third question, right? Like, how can we just upset the cart and redo this because we're not liking the way the cart uh, works, uh, who's in it, what's happening, and maybe even the direction it's going. Um, but I think it's a mistake uh, to take that approach. Um, and I think, I think you can actually, and, and frankly, like urgently we need to, you know, build those conversations around education across these divisions, you know, beginning with that first question, what do we do that we want to continue, right? And then, you know, putting as a last question, what do we want to reimagine, you know, reinvent together, you know, what do we want to do in three months and six months and six years, even in six years? Great, thank you. So, Brian, Noah was talking about bringing people together and the language of social contract theory. I'm a philosopher. This is familiar territory for me. Um, the way this is ordinarily thought of, it is individual rational agents who uh, gather together to secure their, their interests and their rights. Um, what room is there for communities to do this, to enter into social contracts as communities rather than merely as individuals? And here I want to return to something from your, your previous question. Um, you were talking there about the way in which residential schools were uh, separating children from parents as a way of destroying communities, um, a practice that is, of course, all the more destructive in light of the fact that who counts as Native American is often uh, gauged by community affiliation. Um, so how do we secure the right of communities to engage in social contract uh, formation? It's a great question, and I, it's fundamentally necessary um, for us to do that. I, I, I'm going to focus a little bit on on the U.S. Um, I don't think that this is unique to the U.S., but it's kind of what I know well. You all should know I'm a former um, high school social studies teacher, um, and so for me, there's a an interesting set of questions here around civics um, and civics ed and what it means to be part of a collective. So we have a um, a rabid focus in the US, particularly through a juridical system, um, but other systems on um, two things that I think are, are important to your question. One is individuals. Um, so everything's about an individual. If you think about what schools do, one of, the, one of the first things it does is help us begin to categorize things in, in very unique ways, right? Boys on this side, girls on this side, smallest in the front, tallest in the, in the back, and then writing your name. And the penalties for not having your name on work can be somewhat severe, right? So we learn to write our names, it becomes this intense focus on individuals. But then there's also this piece about rights. Um, and in some ways, we everything is about, I mean, you can think about, I've got my mask in my, in my coat, just the intense pushback about mask wearing, um, about vaccinations in this in this recent time became politicized in really fascinating ways around individual rights. What those things leave out, what individuals leave out is what does it mean to be part of a collective and a whole? What rights leave out for me, this rabid focus on it, is on responsibilities. Rights come with responsibilities. We are in the middle of a, starting a new um, election year, there was some, I think there was something happening last night in some town in the um, northeastern, or some state in the northeastern part of the, of the U.S. that's been in the news. And so what does it mean for us to then focus on the collective and group and on responsibility? So for me then, there has to be, we've got to start thinking about what do we do collectively? How do we begin to think about our relationality? Um, indigenous, lots of indigenous philosophies will really suggest that I am because we are. There's, and that's in the US, it's in African philosophies, it's South American, you can find it in all kinds of places. And it's a pushback about around this Cartesian principle of I think, therefore I am. I, there are a couple of philosophers here. So I want to be really careful about delving too deep into this because you all can be rough on 
folks when they get it wrong, but think about where that starts in terms of the philosophies about owning property as an individual rather than collectively. The history of indigenous peoples is to break up reservations and group lands to allot lands, but then also then to have family members spread across huge swaths of land so that they don't work cooperatively. There's real power in, in that. And so I think the social contract has to focus on, on both. What does it mean for us to have a collective set of rights that is enforceable and recognized by places like the Supreme Court and in a juridical system, but also larger questions what our responsibilities are um, to one another. We might ask like, what does it mean to be a good human? But we also might ask, what does it mean to be a good citizen? So we vote, but we vote for very particular reasons. We care for one another. We are in good relations with each other. And I don't think we can have social contracts without, fundamentally without that. Thank you. Uh, let me just say it on behalf of philosophy that we criticize with love. Uh, <laughs> But um, <laughs> uh, Noah, um, picking up on some of the things that, that Brian was just talking about, um, the kinds of community formation that we're talking about um, do have to recognize our location in different kinds of organizations, but also our positionality within those different groupings. So when we talk about stakeholders in education, this includes people who enter into it as students, as teachers, uh, as parents, as families, as communities, as governments, um, possibly as employers. Given that wide array of stakeholders, um, how do we think about fitting together their various interests and values? And how is that going to bear on, on the formation of a social contract that leads us to a better future? Right, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think our best hope is to really emphasize the framing of education as an intergenerational conversation. You know, we are, we're born into a world that's new to us, but that's already ongoing. And I'm getting a little too philosophical here. So you'll, you'll correct me with love. No, I, I love it. Just keep going. <laughs> and so, you know, we bring newness into the world, right? Um, uh, and education is what connects us with the knowledge, the science, you know, the human accomplishments um, of our present and our past, right? Um, so, you know, education is where we both connect to, let's call it like the global knowledge commons, right? Um, that shared heritage, you know, that's problematic. It's imbalanced. There's too many things excluded from it, right? But, but you know, bringing that balance, making it inclusive is part of our project, right? Um, you know, uh, so education is one of the places where we learn to generate new knowledge, new sciences, and so forth. Um, and, and not always, you know, just out of nothing, but out of the remixing, the bricolage, right? Um, the reassembling of, of previous knowledges. So I think Thinking of education as this space of intergenerational contact and intergenerational conversation is a, a key way to bring different stakeholders together. And I mean, I think what's what what makes this particularly pressing right now um, is like the urgent need that we have in our across our societies for intergenerational co leadership. Right. So on the one part, you know, with uh, human lifespans uh, extending, although COVID had its effect there, right? Um, we, we have more people of different generations living together, like under the same roof, you know, than we arguably have at other times. Um, so we need to find ways uh, to engage in intergenerational co-leadership, um, but maybe even more to the point, you know, the problems that our world faces are not ones that can be kicked down the road. So no longer can we think of education as preparing a generation for future leadership and then for there to be a leadership transition. I mean, the Friday, Fridays for the Future has shown us, you know, this powerfully. Uh, it's actually a grave act of intergenerational injustice to leave the future 
to future generations, right? We need to act and we need to learn together to learn to act together now on the future together. And schools are perfect places to do that, right? They bring people together to teach and learn from one another, you know? And, uh, you know, there's of course like a long, and Chicago's a great city for progressive education, but there's, I mean, there's a long standing tradition of designing education, you know, that is about living well together in the now, right? And that's not about sort of setting up these deferred futures. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we have the tools to make education one of the key places where intergenerational co leadership happens. You know, and I'm always, so I'm always struck, you know, in these conversations that we have about greening schools, which is such an important thing to do, you know, that, that needs to not just come from a district office, right? That needs to come from classrooms. I mean, what better way, right? to bring kids together with all those employers, parents, you know, activists, community organization, organizers, right? To make kids and, and empower kids to be the drivers of greening their own schools, right? I mean, that's action you can take you know, like in the now that's gonna have serious positive consequences for the future. Really, I like the idea of empowering um, younger generations so that they are able to exercise their power now and not just in some deferred future. How do we go about doing that, though? I mean, how do we invite, how radical a restructuring is that of our educational practices? It, it sounds like not a small change to make. No, I think it, uh, I think you're right. It requires a lot of changes. I mean, it requires uh, changes on the teaching side. Um, it requires changes on the pedagogy side, on the curriculum side, um, you know, just to proceed quickly in reverse order, and I hope you'll come in too, Brian. Uh, you know, we, we organize the curriculum in our schools today basically according to like a bureaucratic administrative grid, you know, dividing things up into school subjects. Um, yet, and, and I think there's great examples of schools in this neighborhood and other neighborhoods uh, in the state and around the country that do this, we need to move towards, you know, uh, you know, intercultural, ecological, um, interdisciplinary learning. And if you think about it, what each of those things, they're different, obviously, but what they each ask us to do is think in terms of connections more than categories. Right. So one of the things we can do is just profoundly reorient how we think about curriculum. You know, I think we can also profoundly reorient how we think about teaching. You know, in many uh, settings around the world, teaching is what happens when a classroom door closes and a single individual is there teaching a group of students. Uh, I mean, I think the truth of the matter is, and the research shows this, you know, effective pedagogical interactions and effective teaching happens because there's a whole system of people that are working together, right? It's kind of a myth that it's a single, hall, a, sol a single solitary heroic teacher in front of the room. We do need heroic teachers though. <laughs> um, you know, and then, you know, pedagogically, I think we need some reorientation, you know, to thinking about how we, you know, live and learn with others, um, with the world, not just from others and from the world. All right, thank you. Um, Brian, another question about what it means for us to come together and the different purposes that education uh, can and should serve. Uh, this question is, uh, has to do with the way in which um, students um, and communities that have been underserved by our uh, present and past uh, educational practices think about their positioning um, in, in this institution moving forward. So among the, the desires that we might have would be um, the preservation of cultural practices uh, that have come under threat from occupying a minoritized position. On the other hand, we also look for schools to teach people how to get along in the society in which they live. How do we think about balancing these two different goals, which often will you know, pull against each other. Thanks. Um, I've talked the last 25 years that I've been doing this work. Um, I've talked to thousands of American Indian parents about schooling in particular. Um, and not one of those conversations did a parent say to me they didn't want their child to be able to read or write, not once. 
Um, it's also true that not one of them, when offered an opportunity, suggested that they would forego cultural and linguistic opportunities to be able to do that. And so it isn't in some ways that folks, that community members don't want their children to learn and, and really fundamental basic things, how to read, how to write, how to structure arguments, how to do math. Those things are really important, but the, the question that often gets raised is at, at what cost, which is I think the, where your question begins to, to take us. And so for me, there's a, a, um, a set of conversations that I think we need to have in schools, building a little bit, I'm gonna say something a little bit radical and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna make everyone mad probably in the room, um, which is I, I think if we wanna begin to transform schools, we need to find teachers um, and prepare teachers who hated school. Um, often those who go into teaching were really good at it. They did great in school. They, um, they, they did well. Teacher ed programs are hard to get into. Um, if you want to be a teacher, there's a high threshold for your grade point average to, to be able to get into it. Like it's a, it's a thing. And so there's a particular way then of how we just continue a process for young people who go through schooling disliking it intensely they have lots of ways to this there's an intergenerational piece to this but there's also a larger set of epistemological and pedagogical questions i think captured in this which was how do we rethink schools is by in some ways asking folks who didn't do well in them to reimagine them with us not the point of blowing them up. I'm actually not a big blow up kind of person. I think there is a reimagining and a rethinking in that. And the way I tend to think about this is really by thinking about knowledge systems, which are comprised of, for me, kind of five big ideas. I might call them philosophical, but, but probably not. I probably shouldn't. One is epistemology, which is how do we think about, the way I think about this is how do we think about um, what do we know? What is, what is knowledge? How do we come to know? Underlying that question, that set of questions, is a whole bunch of things um, about how we treat knowledge in its production and its reproduction. Um, a second is ontology, um, which I tend to think about, like, what does it mean to be? What is our, what is our reality? Um, and how do we begin to think about what we know and how we be? What does it mean to be in the world? Think about what schools do for us, what larger community does for us in terms of saying, here's how you should be. There's a particular way. Any of us who have boys who've been in, in school, you can watch them wiggle around and do all of these developmentally appropriate things and drive teachers crazy when they're doing exactly what they should be because they're supposed to come in, walk in a very particular way and not run and sit well, that's in some ways a framing around ontological violence in terms of where they should be. And there is in fact a bit of a difference in terms of how boys and girls operate um, and grow and develop. It isn't to say that one's better than the other. It is just sort of a pushback against larger questions of gender and, and what have you. But there's some interesting brain science around that. There's a question here around pedagogy. How do we think about both teaching and and learning so that your question fundamentally is a pedagogical one how do we think about what we're teaching but also how do we take seriously the ways in which um, people learn there's an axiological question here I, um, in some ways philosophers think about axiology as the aesthetics what's beautiful larger questions of beauty i tend to think about it as what's good true right and beautiful there are values in what we are doing and, and we've got to get really clear about those cultural norms um, there and making them really explicit, which we often don't do. Like there's a particular way to do school and there's underlying sets of values around that. And then the fifth is a larger set of questions around cosmology. Like where is the beginning? More importantly, the question is where's the origin? What is the origin of schools? What's the origin of learning? How do we begin to think about that? So Evanston is founded, I don't know, 1867. So that's the beginning, but it's not the origin because there were peoples here long before that. I don't have the dates right, so you historians will get um, upset with me. But um, when we put those things together, how do we think about knowledge? What's our state of being? How do we think about teaching and learning? What are our value propositions and where do we start? 
a set of conversations becomes a that shifts us away from not we all care about teaching and and um, or, or about particular sets of content, but it reframes the way we think about how that gets delivered and how it gets accepted. Thank you. That, I think this, uh, that last remark is a very profound one because many of us get into the field because we love the subject matter. And it doesn't necessarily translate into loving our students, all of them. Um, all right, a very quickly, uh, very short question and answer before we open this up to the floor generally uh, for both of you. Um, when you think about the future of education, what are you most afraid of and what are you most excited about? I mean, when I think about the future in general, I, uh, I think like many people feel there's, there's a lot we need to prevent, you know, uh, social disintegration, economic volatility. I mean, a lot of this stuff is on us already, you know, political fragmentation, um, you know, deepening inequalities, climate change. Um, you know, I, I see all of this as part of a deepening interdependence, right? Uh, an increasing awareness that humanity and the planet are bound together in, in, a, in a common fate. Um, I mean, I have hope in that, you know, we are at a moment where we have more tools to work together than ever before, like our communication abilities to know what's going on, to interact with one another are truly amazing. They need to be harnessed for good though, right? Our collaboration skills, our ability to move resources and people around the planet, connect them, are just extraordinary, right? So there's a lot of potential. I mean, in, if pushed for education, my biggest fear um, is that we're gonna completely mismanage uh, climate migration. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Guy Evans's book, Nomad Century. You know, we are already in a world that's being reshaped by people on the move because of climate change. Uh, and that poses huge issues for education, frankly, huge opportunities, you know, in education, right, to adapt together, right, to learn together. So uh, that's what I worry about. But I also think um, that's something we can really productively work together on. I fear that we maintain the status quo um, and we keep doing what we've done and without recognizing the fact that it disenfranchises a whole bunch of, of people. I, I, I fear that we don't engage um, the world through a lens of curiosity um, and wonderment. I worry that we don't ask questions about what if we tried this. I, I worry that we um, engage in a, in a future through fear rather than let's try it and, and see. We are all, I, I worry that we will continue to be afraid of mistakes. And I think f mistakes are, are both necessary, but also the greatest places for us to learn. I think my hope is that we um, figure out how to listen to young people. I am, um, this job is great. Um, because we get to be, every year I get older, it feels like the students get younger, but they don't. Um, but they're just so smart. Um, I think our students are brilliant. I think young people are brilliant. I think um, I have hopes that we will learn how to listen to them and be guided with them and to prepare them for the futures in which they're going to live, but also allow them to help us imagine what kinds of futures might be possible. Excellent. If we can, if we can honor their hopes, I think we'll be in a better uh, place. Uh, let's open the floor to questions now. Who would like to ask our, our um, guest speakers uh, about international education? Hi. Thank you for a very provocative discussion. Uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, the fear of maintaining the status quo and also the role of produ producing knowledge. Um, and my question relates to both of those concepts. We're at an age where, you know, the new modem for economic uh, uh, thinking is that data is the new oil and data relates to knowledge, although I understand it is not the same as knowledge. And my understanding of the status quo is that it was designed and it evolved into 
a means of producing citizens that could be productive economically in an industrial capitalist kind of a mode, which was good to make people economically productive, but it didn't really address their whole human needs. Now, as we try to shift away, as it was mentioned, we have to decide what we want to keep and what we want to create new. Uh, what will be the prevailing paradigms of the shifts that we will make away from an industrial capitalism, but maybe maintaining a good part of it still? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for that. Um... I want to be careful about how I answer this. So we live in a world where there is a profound sense of economically that we should be creating huge swaths of abundance for individuals. Um, there are four, the four richest people in, in the U.S. own almost as, have as much wealth as everyone else. Um, it, it, it's wild, enough that they can put a rocket into into space um, with what it would cost to, in some ways, address hunger um, in powerful ways. And so I think we have to shift away. It's not an anti-capitalist response, just to be clear, um, as much as it is an anti-overabundance of things that relies on, on abundance for a few, for massive scarcity for a whole bunch of of other people. So un until we shift our thinking about what it means and the possibilities for people, everyone to be able to thrive and move away from zero sum thinking, we, that's, that's a big shift, I think, that, that we're going to have to work toward, which requires a, a collective response, a sense of collectivity, a sense that we are all in this together, to think that there are people who are hungry um, who continue to be hungry, you children who go to school hungry, for people who are cold um, in places like Chicago where the power company will turn off their heat if they can't pay for us to turn blind eyes to folks who need things, um, all in the name of kind of rugged individualism and, and whatever else. We've got to shift some of our thinking about about that and move away from sort of thinking for you to be in the 1%, there's got to be a whole bunch of, there's got to be people in the 99% of, of this. So I, I think there's a big economical push about this. I also think there's got to be a shift for us to um, be open to reimagining and questioning. We had this great conversation last night with this woman named Ruha Benjamin, who's a sociologist at Princeton. And I think what she invited us in to do is to begin to reimagine what's possible and for us to begin to question structures that are like that. So I think economic structures we've got to question and I think educational ones and what are our responsibilities to one another and how do we begin to collectively move toward a future where everyone thrives? Like the, it, it is possible for everyone to thrive. If we reimagine what thriving looks like. Um, so I think that's part of the shift that has to happen. And it's a radical shift, just to be clear. Yeah, I, if, I totally agree that that shift to an abundance mindset is crucial. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always struck that in, in a typical classroom, there's like such a missed opportunity, okay? So we bring 25, 35, you know, 60, some places, 80 people together into the same space to learn together. And all we folk care about at the end of the day is individual accomplishment, right? not what that group can accomplish together, right? And that's a status quo we really need to change because we need to focus on the collaboration, the cooperation, the solidarity that can be built, that you know, we need to sharpen our individual and collective capacities to work together. That's what all the problems in the world are pointing us to need to do a better job at. Right. Um, the, the second thing I would say is, you know, uh, another shift in the status quo is I think we need to move away from thinking. Uh, I'm not going to speak for Northwestern, but for you know, higher ed in general, there's quite often a focus on employability. Right. Um, and I, I'm not going to blame a parent or a student who's laying out a tremendous investment 
um, in hope of a future, right? Um, but I would, I, I would suggest we need to reframe that in terms of uh, how we provision economic security, right? Which goes beyond, well beyond the, the wage economy, right? Um, it gets into the care economy. It gets into the regulations that make our world like a safe place, you know, where the air is clean and the water is available, right? Um, I mean, those are real matters of, of economic security. Um, and, you know, we need education systems that move us in those directions, not just preparing us, you know, for this, you know, to do well and get a first class ticket on this train that's heading towards a cliff. Can I just make one more point about this? I, in terms of the collectivity, just to be clear, you, it, it, it is not just possible, but necessary for to have a collective where individuals thrive. Collectivity doesn't erase individuals, right? It, it just reframes the focus a bit about the well-being of a whole rather than individuals. And frankly, if the whole is well, so are its individual members. And those who aren't, there's a move toward ensuring that they do well and they thrive. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, May finds the next um, person from the audience. I'll read a question from Zoom. Um, if we are to create a new educational paradigm that is generational, who names the leaders of such a process and content, and how does the new education spread? I think leaders emerge from sets of iterations and questions um, that happen. But I, I, um, it's an interesting question because I don't think it's a singular. It is possible to have multiple leaders. It is possible to move towards consensus. It is possible to say, we're going to be guided by a question. What are the conditions for us to be able to thrive? What are the conditions for society to be able to thrive? And then allow the questions about um, of then who leads. I think there's probably different sets of leaders in it. And it moves beyond, I mean, for me, leadership isn't about some honorific. It isn't you're the director of this or you're the dean of, of this. It's, it's, it's not a noun, it's a verb. And it can be owned, I think, by lots of, lots of people. So for me, I'd rather center a set of questions like, what is it that we're, where are we trying to be? Um, and then the iteration process of that leaders will more emerge. The folks who lead in, um, in elementary schools often very quietly is a custodial staff and the lunch ladies. They're the ones ensuring that things are, are happening and moving along in, in schools. They're the ones who talk to kids and get them settled down. They're the ones who understand where there are, are needs. And, they have no honor, like there isn't an honorific that suggests they're, they're leading. It's, it's really what they do in the process. Great, thank you. There was so much food for thought here, I'm going to try very hard to frame this in a sufficiently pithy fashion. Um, I'm going to start with a question that is targeted more directly towards Dean Brayboy, because I would love to have your thoughts particularly on uh, tribal colleges as a response to a sense of having greater collective autonomy vis-a-vis -vis, or in contrast to the boarding schools or the, the 18th century Dartmouth model, right? Trying to reverse that. To what extent you think they, what you consider their benefits and deficits and also how you think they blend into our larger system of higher ed. And this is where um, I, I come, you know, we're sitting at Northwestern, we have a speaker from Northwestern, a speaker from Loyola, both of which are born of an early modern European model where the job was, the, the aim of education was not employment, the aim was catechesis. And the outcome was to bring people into a, a sense of belief and salvation even sending kids home then to convert their convert their parents if you're going back to the 16th century models of it is that now dead should we not be at private universities should we should we be moving on to something that is imbued in what i 
I appreciate your sense of place, that we should have it as both geography and meaning so that private education gets written off and it is done instead on a level that is really determined by geography and that type of connection. Two very easy questions free of landmines. Like what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Um, I'm going to answer the first one. I'll let you answer the second one, Noah. Um, since I work at a private institution now, um, the idea of tribal colleges and, and universities starts in 1972 with what was in Navajo Community College, which is now Diné College. Um, by the way, for the historians in the crowd, like all this great stuff for indigenous peoples happens under Nixon's presidency. It's kind of an interesting thing. He was remarkable for Native peoples, and in some of our communities, he's revered for all of the great things that happened under his administration. Um, tribal colleges and universities, the intent is really to allow um, tribal members to stay in the communities where they are from, where there is spiritual nourishment, where they can learn and potentially utilize the places where they live as a pedagogical partner. And so it's not just the stuff that's in the classroom, it's about being able to relate and to stay there. You're, it, it's an, in some ways an, an antidote to the poisoning of, of removing people out and larger questions of brain drain. And so the idea of that and being able to, to understand who people are and, and what's happening is, is like a fundamentally great idea. There are some significant challenges with the 37 tribal colleges and universities that start um, fundamentally with the economics of, of the model um, and how do you pay for, for that? Who's responsible for it? Two of those are paid for by the federal government. The others are, um, are, are usually paid for through philanthropy and, um, and through a tribal nation. And so I think there's a bunch of, of um, challenges for them. One is who teaches. Um, if you think about how many native peoples um, graduate from high school, it's somewhere around 68. Um, about a tenth of them go to end up with a, a bachelor's degree. And you can sort of think about what the numbers are beyond that. And so it's not just that Native people should be teaching Native students, to be clear, right? I'm not, not suggesting that. Like my best mentors, um, alongside of my best mentors, are non-Native peoples. They continue to um, to be in my best teachers, besides my parents and my grandparents, in some ways are, are, are non-Native people. So I'm not suggesting that. Um, but there aren't enough of them. There also, there's a bit of a trap around accreditation about how then schools get structured. So they all have presidents and provosts and yada, yada, yada. And that model doesn't work there, actually. It's not a, it's not a tribal model. It's a tribal college and university some, in some ways in name only like there's all of these other things that go on, but the structure doesn't tend to work. And so there's there's some struggles there that I think are are there. The possibilities are endless. Like the students are brilliant. They get to stay home. You're not removing them um, from their leadership and community positions. They get to address the collective. You take education to them rather than asking them to leave South Dakota or Arizona or North Carolina and come to Evanston, which is a beautiful place, but they, they get to stay there. So I think there are all these great possibilities, but I think the model in some ways we've got to rethink. Let me just try a concise, hopefully not too pithy, really comment on the sort of the, the importance of the publicness of education. So to use a technical term, I think non-state actors, um, and I would include private universities like the two mentioned, um, are, are actually key in advancing the publicness of education. By that I mean education that, that takes place in a public space in some measure. I think that's true at both of these universities. Education that promotes public interests, right? That has that as one of its key objectives. And education that has a, a strong measure of public accountability. And I think those are things we can require of Northwestern and Loyola, et cetera, et cetera, as much as the University of Illinois and so forth. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, 
Oh, no, no problem. Hi, everybody. I'm Jess. Uh, I use they, them. My uh, disability is I'm a type 1 diabetic. So um, I'm trying to formulate my question really quickly here. So there's theory and practice. I heard a lot of discussion about epistemology and ontology. I heard the word we and community used a lot and these sort of the reference to the model or a model. Um, and then I and then I look and I and I don't know who you are exactly except based on your expertise. Um, and what I see is a is a, is a several he hymns, right? So you are the experts producing this lecture of uh, information about a model of education. And what I didn't hear is that there's there's a lot of futures going on. There's disability futures. This is massive population of people. Um, there's queer futures. Uh, this sort of uh, explodes the whole dominant paradigm that you all referenced a few times. Um, so there's there's this very ginormous, rich, provocative, thoughtful, engaged uh, landscape of futures uh, that I didn't I didn't see represented here. Thanks for that. I don't. There are lots of days I don't know who I am either. So. Um... I think it's a fair critique, um, and I think that, that for me, in some ways, this is the start of a set of conversations. What I did hear us saying is, is that um, being able to think and listen carefully and have other peoples um, participate in whatever kinds of futures they want to create as a collective um, is present, but I, I don't, I mean, beyond that, I think Fair enough as a as a critique. I hear you. Yeah, Jess, I hear it as well. I mean, I think uh, uh, you know, I've personally learned a huge amount from reading and engaging with alternative futures. And I and just to I mean go back to what I said at the beginning, you know, it's key that there's an S, you know, that this is a notion in the plural, right? Um, and your your point underscores that, and I fully agree. Okay, thank you. As we continue thinking about how our global futures will and will not intersect with one another, uh, let me invite you all to join us uh, at a reception outside these doors, where I hope you'll stick around and connect with each other and our guests. Thank you very much, Brian and Noah, for joining us.